Mm -hmm. So data analytics seems to be the rage all over the place and I see that even CSA is offering a course this time on data analytics. And uh, what I work on is uh, a subset, I mean data analytics spans different kinds of data and I focus more on urban data, that's basically data from cities. And uh, my focus is more on a particular type of analytics which is more visual analytics. It's using visualization to analyze and uh, extract information from the data. So what is urban data? So there's lots of data available from cities. You're getting data from public transport. And OK, this is specific to US, where you have 311 complaints, 911 complaints, and of course, social media, Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter. And many cities, they are not just collecting this data, but they are also making it available for free. So you can actually search for NYC open data or the Chicago data portal or the Seattle open data. And you can get all the data corresponding to that city. So analysis of this data can actually help uh, planners, be it traffic or even other kinds of verbal planners or architects, plan, understand how cities work and kind of plan their policies based on this. And it, in general, it helps improve the quality of life of people in a city. And uh, urban data has a particular kind of characteristics, properties, which is, I wouldn't say unique, but it kind of focuses on one type. And basically, it, is, it has a spatial context. It is from a city. And each city has a different structure. And you have, I mean, it can be divided into different places. So you have data from different parts of the city. So there's a lot of uh, spatial context in this. And moreover, a recent study where we just look at uh, all the urban data sets uh, from the US, and we found that over 50% of them have a spatial context corresponding to it. It also has a temporal attribute. Cities keep changing. It continuously changes. And uh, so each, thank you. And so each time something happens, the data changes. So what we have is, data that is changing over space and also changing over time. And moreover, it's large. You have a large amount of data that's coming from cities. It's large not just in terms of size, even the number of data sets. Like I showed, there are over 9,000 different data sets. Each of them have, on an average, 5 to 10 attributes. And uh, some of them go to uh, terabytes and even petabytes of data. And this is my bunny data set, literally. So it's like the taxi data has a lot of characteristics that are part of urban data. And uh, so you can show a lot of your analysis techniques and the usefulness of the techniques through the taxi data. And I'll, in this talk, I'll basically be focusing on this particular data set, even though some of the techniques that I show is general and can be applied to other data sets. And we have uh, applied it to other data sets. So, in New York City alone, there are these yellow cabs, taxis, which uh, operate, they are perform over 170 million trips in a year. And the data set consists, uh, for each trip, the data set uh, it gives us the pickup location and the drop off location of a trip, along with the pickup and drop off times. And it also has other information corresponding to the trip, such as the fare, the tip that is paid, and uh, uh, was it paid through a credit card or cash, and so on. So how do people usually explore urban data? And that would, the, most of this data is new. And typically, what people do is they try to visualize the data, try to see how it changes, and so on. And there are a lot of visual interaction tools that have been developed for this purpose. And this one particular tool is uh, called TaxiVis the one that I'm uh, showing over here. So basically, all of this allows you to explore the data, query the data. Yeah. I'm a little puzzled by your uh, specific focus on your taxi data, because presumably there's a lot of other traffic also. So yes. what you get from this may not really extrapolate to the world at, at large, because there's a lot of other private vehicles which are going on the road. That's true. That is true. Uh, with respect to other cities, it is true. But here, again, uh, we are focusing on New York. And in New York, you can actually say that this is, the this is the primary source of traffic. 
And uh, okay, this project was more done, and uh, the taxi work that we are doing was done more with respect to uh, working with the Taxi and Limousine Commission and the Department of Transportation over there. And uh, yeah, the focus is more on New York City, but like I said, the techniques that I'm going to be showing need not be. The yellow cabs. Not the no, not the Uber. The, uh, we still don't have the Uber data yet. Uber is very, uh, they don't want to give away data. So. <laughs> yes, but I think even now in New York, they have uh, mandated that Uber has to give some amount of the data regarding their trips to the TLC, and uh, the TLC has promised us that they'll be giving us the data soon. Okay, so here the overall goal is more like try to find out different things from the data. We don't have an hypothesis. This is going to help build the hypothesis. So, I mean, you have, most of them haven't even looked at this data before. So they don't know what to expect. And some of them, even if they hypothesize, they don't know how to go about working with this data. And again, you can use these visual interaction tools, but even though they are effective and this particular tool is being used currently by TLC, uh, it is still impractical to search through all the time slices that are there. So we have data worth five years, amounting to close to a billion trips uh, with respect to TAPSI. So the problem that I'm going to be focus on, focusing on is more like how can you guide users towards interesting slices of the data? So instead of saying uh, this is something in between completely automatic methods which just takes the data, does some processing and says, okay, this is what is interesting. Or the other extreme is, look, here's the data, you explore the whole thing. We want to be somewhere in between. We're in saying that these are potential time steps, time slices, where something interesting happens. Go have a look at it. If you don't like it, you can still explore the other parts. And to do that, we are going to be focusing on what we call as events in the data. So essentially, it's some sort of event-guided exploration of urban data sets. And uh, again, uh, I'll be focusing on two kinds of events that happens, or patterns. So. The first thing is more like static patterns. So I'll be giving you an example uh, soon. So here it is like there are fixed patterns that happen at different time steps. <coughs> and uh, for this, we uh, use scalar field, uh, I mean techniques from scalar field visualization applied to this kind of data and try to do it. And the other kind of patterns is more like the mobility patterns, like traffic flow and so on. And for this, the inspiration is more from uh, vector field visualization techniques. So the first part I'm going to be talking about is on identifying static patterns and using this to guide uh, users towards interesting data slices. And we have actually built this whole uh, framework for this purpose. So what kind of events can happen in the data? So you can have major events that occur in a city, and especially in New York, has a lot of these hurricanes, or Hurricane Sandy, or Irene. Or you could have even have small events that occur over short periods of time. So a typical example is, uh, if you look at, this is like all the trips, or the location of taxis, the pickup and drop-off locations in Manhattan. So this is the outline of Manhattan. I don't think you can see the map clearly. And uh, this is at between 8 and 10 p.m. Uh, on uh, May 1st, 2011. And if you notice this whole stretch on 6th Avenue, so this part, there are no taxis over there. This is because that whole stretch of the road, the whole avenue was blocked for the fiber or bike tour that happens on an annual basis. So since there are no taxis over there, you can actually, I mean, uh, you can see that whole spot. So these are some kind of a small event. And there are a lot of such events that happen in New York. And there are also accidents which could cause such uh, blockages and so on. And uh, existing techniques, usually analysis techniques, the data analytics, what they do is they perform some sort of aggregation. And then they try to uh, okay, find patterns from the aggregated data. 
So typically, say for example, let's take the taxi data itself and aggregate over space. And if you just plot the number of trips that happen over time, and uh, you can actually see that the big events, which has a major impact, kind of you can make out clearly over here. So this is Irene Sandy, and the other is uh, this is Sandy, and this is sorry, this is Sandy, and this is the Irene. But if you move on to uh, some of these small events that happen, like the uh, bike tour. This one, yes. This one, yes. Yes, this is known. But that's not the focus. The focus is more on these kind of smaller events. And uh, if you again notice over here, you see that at the time, so what we have done here is we have plotted the number of trips over an hour for three different, three consecutive Sundays. So this happened on a Sunday, just to make sure that let it have the same kind of distribution. And you still cannot find any difference between the three because of the aggregation. And even when you aggregate over time, uh, over this, uh, so this is for one whole day, we just plot it as a heat map, and you can, Notice that we still don't find such patterns in the data. And of course, there are these automatic uh, event detection methods uh, that do a lot of this. But the problem there is, again, almost all of them, they fix the shape of an event. They say, OK, events, they typically divide the whole space into a set of grids, and then they do some processing on the grid. And they also fix other parameters as to how long an event can be or how short the event can be and so on. And many of these techniques are really slow, often even exponential in time. And uh, because they fix the kind of events, you can actually miss multiple events. And like I again said, so the goal here is more to guide users towards interesting slices through finding these events. But the kind of events that we want is we want it to be flexible. So what do I mean by flexibility? It can have an arbitrary shape. So for example, the bike tour is along one avenue. And instead, you could also have uh, some other event, for example, uh, I mean, which blocks one whole block or two consecutive blocks, which has a different shape. So we want a different shape. And we found different types of events, not just where something is missing, but also maybe where something is abundant. And uh, we also want different temporal scales. So we don't want something happens for just maybe two hours. But we want say something happens on a daily basis or a weekly basis. We want to have events that span multiple temporal scales. And another goal is it's not just finding events. So there are also cases wherein the experts are already interested in a particular pattern. And they want to search for similar patterns over the entire data. How can you do it efficiently? So our framework is basically, uh, we take the input, and we use uh, ideas from uh, computational topology to identify what we call as micro events. So a micro event is basically a potential event that happens in one time step. So we basically discretize the entire time. And in one particular time step, what are all the potential events? From this, we basically index this into a hash-like index to get macro events. So for example, if you take the bike tour example, it happens for, say, two consecutive time steps, two hourly time steps. And uh, we want both of them, since it happens on the same space and around the same time, we want them grouped together in a single uh, event group uh, macro event. And uh, using this index, we actually wish create a simple uh, couple of visualization uh, widgets and an interface from which users can quickly find potentially interesting events and view what those events are. So in this case, using the visualization and just selecting uh, some sort of an outlier from a graph, you can actually get the fiber object tour. And moreover, if I want to search for all other patterns that are similar to the fiber object tour, I can do a query and get the different events. And this experiment was done on two years' worth of data. And uh, we act when we search for fiber object tour, we find the same event for the next year. We also find a Dominican Day Parade for the two years. And this was something that was interesting, which we didn't know beforehand was more like the Gaza solidarity protest that happened also happened on, at the same venue. Just 
not necessarily. Okay, so the examples I'm showing you are yes, they are common sense so that it shows the validation of how it is useful. But there are other events like, for example, we applied the same technique on even the MTA data and we were speaking with people from uh, the Metropolitan uh, Transport Authority. And when we showed them some of the things that we found, they were like, they really were surprised that such things could happen. So yeah, what I'll be focusing on are the obvious things so that it is easy for others to say, yes, we are correct. Otherwise, they are, they are going to ask, why on earth, uh, how do I know that you are right? An example of an insight they got from this data that they didn't, so this is, you're saying this to a proto. Yeah. Show them the interface and they actually discovered some pattern and said, hey, I know what happened there. Yes, they did. That would be, uh, they did. So yeah, that they example did. Example would kind of help. Yes, so yeah. that's the kind of example that I'm going to be giving in this talk. Oh. Because this one gives you similar events on the same street, right? Or is it uh, going to map across uh, any street where a similar? Uh, no, this is around the same region, but with potentially different shapes, basically. So, it, for example, if a this is smaller. On 42nd Street, it'll have a similar effect of emptying the whole street. Yes. So you should be able to. Whatever I yes, we will be finding those kind of parades, yes. So another thing is, uh, so as of now, you say events, like whether, whether it's micro, or, or I guess micro determinants of the micro events are, uh, you are talking about spatial uh, events that disrupt the space in some way. Yes. Is that what you are yeah. saying? So I'll be, the next slide is basically about that. So the main idea here is to use uh, topology. So we model the data as a time varying scalar function defined on a graph. And uh, in, for example, again, for the taxi data, one of the functions that you can define is the density. So what this does is we take the road network of uh, Manhattan and uh, kind of for each point over there, we look at the density of taxis at that point at that particular time. And uh, this is visualized using a heat map, which goes from white to black for low to high. And uh, like I said, using topology, we have different types of events. So one is when you look at the minimum. So this is like when there's lack of taxis compared to the neighborhood. So you get one kind of event. Or when you look at the maximum, so you get a different kind of feature. So here there is a lot of taxi compared to its local neighborhood. And moreover, as you can see from these examples itself, you can have different shapes for events. The shape is uh, provided by the function, by the data, rather than we defining what the shape of an event is supposed to be. No, so these are not moving taxis. These are pick up and drop of locations. So that is where a lot of, uh, uh, what do you say, business happens, possibly. Or there have there has been a lot of that depends very much on the application. So it, in some cases, if you're interested in finding, so one of the use cases that the TLC are interested in is they want, uh, and this is a problem that they had. Most of the taxis congregate only in certain areas because they know they get more business from there. And because of which there are other parts of Manhattan. And if you go to Brooklyn or Queens, you just cannot find yellow cabs. And uh, so it's like they want to, even in Manhattan, there are different areas where you cannot find yellow cap. So if you find a minimum that is common for a long period of time, then obviously they need to push someone to say, go there. People over there are not finding caps. And uh, the use of topology is, of course, it's really efficient. So how do we uh, identify macro events? Basically, these the set of minima or the maxima and the regions corresponding to it. So we use uh, what we call merge trees to identify these events. So what is a merge tree? Let's consider a simple terrain. And uh, the function is the height. So for each point in this terrain, the function value is the height of this point. So uh, what I'm showing here is a set of uh, maxima. So there are four maxima. And the merge tree tracks uh, the connectivity of level sets of these maxima. So if you keep increasing or decreasing the function value, the number of components of a level set, in this case an isocontour, is going to change. 
and uh, the merge tree tracks the ISO contours and gives an abstract representation of the entire domain or the function. So here you can again see that this particular uh, point over here where these two edges merge correspond to this saddle over here. And the advantage is if you look at each edge and the corresponding region, you can get a nice segmentation of the entire domain. So here, I don't know how clear the colors are, but the color of an edge is mapped to the corresponding uh, region, the segmented region over here. So what we do is to find, so in this case, we are looking at the maxima, and we take the edge corresponding to that maxima, and we look at that segment, and that is going to give us the micro event for our particular time step. And another advantage is, say for example, you are interested in only the significant events. So if you notice, there is V3 over here, which is a really small kind of peak, and maybe it's not interesting. So I can simplify the graph and get just the main significant events. And for the taxi data, we again use the volume as an importance measure. <coughs> Uh, one block that's typical for Manhattan it's kind of fixed almost it's like 200 meters radius if you take too small a neighborhood what's going to happen is the the taxis are generally within that particular road region and uh, so it's like each block has one street and since we are defining the function on a node of a graph the vertex so we want to cover the entire street. So we take, it's roughly half a street on each direction that we take, so that the taxis are covered. Even is the density, is it the number of taxis or whatever that? Yeah, it's just the density or the count, in a simple way. So once we have these small events, you can have a lot of them, some of them may be totally uninteresting. So what we do is we need to group them into similar events. And uh, for this, we again fix it into different bins and then kind of group them within each bin. So in this case, say for example, we take all the micro events that happen in a month and we group them into a set of macro events. And uh, the way we group them is we use two kinds of similarity. One is a geometric similarity. So we want all events to have a similar shape. And for this, since the domain is a graph and an event is a subgraph, we use the graph distance metric. And uh, we also want, we just don't want the same shape, but we also want the topological uh, importance or the significance to be the same. So we look at the difference between the two uh, importance measures that we use to give us a topological similarity. So we say two events are uh, similar if the graph distance metric and the topological similarity is within a very small threshold. And using this, we kind of create, uh, so basically all of these event groups, you can think of it like a hash-like index. And uh, so we have different bins for each event group. And uh, so uh, this is over time. So each, uh, so we group events over time. So time step is one hour? Yes, so currently each time step is one hour. You can change it to however you want. But the data is available. The accuracy up to a second. We have the exact second where the pickup. Exactly. Yeah, we have the. You could choose a much smaller one or a much bigger one based on your uh, requirement. Uh, yeah. So again, uh, like I said, we do it for particular periods. We do it on a monthly period. Since it's more like an index, you can search later. So uh, I'll come to that later. How we do that. So uh, based on this similarity, we create this index. And uh, so you can create this index for on a monthly basis so that when new data comes, you can add it. And then later, the search is going to be, you have to do a linear search across months, but which is still a little faster. And the key for this index is uh, basically uh, the graph intersection. So you have the different events, and you know all of them are similar. So the intersection is basically going to give us the graph part or the geometric part of the key and then we also have the average uh, topological importance which is going to give us the uh, the topological importance part of it so 
Uh, and while computing the event group, we do it, and I'm not going to go into details of how exactly we compute it. And so basically how a search is performed is you give a pattern or you find a pattern, the user can actually see a pattern and query for it over the entire data. And for that pattern, we know the type it is, we know the shape of it, and we know the topological uh, significance of it. And so using that, you just have to search through the different keys over here, and we just do a very simple search over the different keys. It's just a, and then we get the different patterns. But even when we find macro events, you can have some which is interesting, some which just doesn't make sense. So how do we even visualize this? You can have a lot of these events. You can have thousands or more. And uh, in order to do that, we create two simple uh, visualization widgets. So let me show it with a toy example here. So the first one is what we call the timeline view. And uh, here I have four different uh, event groups or macro events. So the first green event is like you have two micro events. The typical example is a bike tour again, which occur in consecutive hours. And uh, what we visualize here is the time of the events and since they are connected. So in this case, you have two events that occur on consecutive days. So maybe something happened today at 10 a.m., the same thing happens tomorrow at 10 a.m. This one is like two events that happen on consecutive weeks. And in this particular example, so this is like an event that occurs on every hour during every day over the entire week. Uh, no. So this can be obtained from the event group itself. So each event group, you know all the events corresponding to it. So based on the events in it, you can find it. So we classify that. I'll, that's the next part. So given that, so this is one visualization wherein you can look at the actual events and how much they span. And uh, the other visualization is uh, the event distribution view. So what we do here is we take the x-axis here as a density. So you have an event group, and then you know the time range of the event group. When, uh, from when the event started and when was the last time, the, the last event that was there in the event group. And you know the number of events in that event group. So the time range is the y-axis and the density of the each event group is the x-axis. So for example, take the green event over here. It has a density one because it has two events which occurs over two hours. Or if you take the blue event over here, so it again has a density one, and but it has a very high time range. Similarly, you can have different values based on the range and the thing. So if you look at it, you can roughly divide it into four quadrants. And these are the two quadrants that I'm very interested in. One is the rare occurrence of these events. So this is because you know this event happens one-off, but when it happens, it happens continuously. Or something that is very frequent. It happens continuously and it's always there. Could be. Uh, I cannot guarantee that it is a car crash. So basically, disruption yes, car yes, crash. yes. And since you have data about car crashes on a weekly, daily basis, would you be able to do an experiment of yes. identifying this, mapping it, and yes. it? Yes, so that is something that we are actually working on right now, looking at this data, trying to combine it with other external data sets to automatically find. So here what we did was we found a lot of these events and interesting events that we could That's find. So in this case, an event is just... Uh, what is micro noise, micro? And what is the... I don't... Why on earth is it interesting? Okay, that's what I'm trying to figure out because... Give me an example where I can... Um, for example, some suspicious activity is happening because that pattern has happened when a car bomb happened two years ago. Right, right. Now, I want that kind of connection. Is there a way 
which you can try this out. That's where I have to yeah, 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 that can be easily tried here. So that's, uh, like I said, we have these, and what we did was many of the things that we found, the disruptions that we found, we manually Googled it to find out yeah. why it happened. Correct. Correct. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll be showing later on when I look at the mobility patterns, uh, we had no idea what those patterns were. But when we showed it to people from uh, uh, the Department of Transportation, they could immediately say, okay, this is something that I know w why that's happening. So it's, uh, if I can phrase it, you were inventing a tool and letting people use it. Yeah, exactly, right. The other end, it's not that you had a problem to solve and no. said, so you had, here's a lot of data, let me do something with it, and here is some patterns that have emerged, I'm going to show it to experts and say, do you make sense? Is yeah, that yes, that's the thing, and the experts actually said, yes, it makes so sense. That, that yes part is what I'm trying to focus on. And uh, so again, like here, these are the two interesting uh, quadrants over here. And uh, given that, uh, we are interested more on high density events. And instead of looking at an hourly range, you can look at a uh, daily basis, in which case this daily event again moves to this quadrant. Or you can look at a weekly basis, wherein you can move. So basically, you have all this data. And you have some uh, abstraction of the data. Now, any expert or any user who wants to analyze this data can use the visual interface, can select different events to see if it's interesting why that's happening. So typically, again, to answer your question on uh, accident and that disrupting uh, thing, especially if an accident happens, say, near Times Square. So that's definitely going to disrupt, and it's going, we are going to find a, a minima event over there for a short period. And uh, the, the question of is mapping it with once we get the accident data, if we have the list of all the car crashes, we can do a join of the two data sets. Thank you so much for following up on that question. Uh, you have pickup and drop locations. Yeah. Mean, right? yeah. So you don't have we don't have the actual trajectory. So how does that uh, translate into traffic? I mean, initially, oh, uh, that's actually the next part of the talk. But. <laughs> so, okay, just to quickly answer that part of it. Even though we have pickup and drop off, there are so many trips that are happening, which is happening all over Manhattan. And uh, we have, okay, we actually have a technique which we uh, use to get the route of the taxis. We derive the route of the taxis, and then from there we get the traffic of the traffic details of Manhattan, and we have validated with the actual partially available traffic details of Manhattan. No, for now, this doesn't use. So this is basically like, so you have a crowded area. You know Times Square or Penn Station or any of these areas, you know there are supposed to be taxis. But if there's a disruption, you get this big opening. And this is not true, again, uh, so. So, the, so the, 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 the number of pickups and drop-offs are so high yes. that even, uh, so for example, that bike tour that you were talking about, Exactly. So I mean, just look at this is one time step of the data, and we are just plotting all the points. I don't think all the points are also plotted because it's so cluttered. And you see this pick up and drop off happening everywhere, at least in the main part of Manhattan. So any disruption, you can see it even from here. I mean, this is again Manhattan specific or big city specific. In downtown Chicago, you would have the same thing. So, so far I've basically been using toy examples. So let me actually show it with the actual taxi data that we have and uh, some of the events that we found. And uh, to be honest, I really didn't know a lot of these events I happened, even happened in Manhattan until I was working on this project. Even though, like you said, any taxi driver could tell you, but many of them are not very familiar with it. So, this is again for October 2011, and uh, this is the actual all the event groups, the significant event groups over here. And you can see that there is this guy that is kind of lying out over there. It's a high density event, but with a low time range. So if you select that, it corresponds to this part in Sixth Avenue, and uh, this is where the Halloween parade happened. So this happened for a period of uh, I think six or seven hours from. 5 p.m. till midnight, approximately. 
and you can just quickly find it. So this tool is more like to help users find these, go there, then look, explore. Understand what the data provides you, what kind of insights you can get from the data. <coughs> and say instead of daily or hourly events, I want to look at what daily events that occur. And here again, I, the range is now in days, so the density is in days. And if I look at events that occur for two days, we have three different events. And if I choose a one with the most uh, significant one over there, what we find is, again, uh, an avenue, the fifth avenue that is blocked. And uh, this is because of the Hispanic Day Parade and Columbus Day Parade happening one day after the other. No, here these are just showing the different events. These are showing the different events. Events, yes. So now what I'm showing is all the minima events that is over here. And uh, the selected event is highlighted in blue. So you know where that event occurs, you know at what time that event occurs. And like I said, you should be able to search for these kind of events. So if we just take this Hispanic Day Parade, and say, let me search. I want to find all other times when there has been not, uh, when that road has been blocked, for example. And what we find is a set of different parades and other. It's like the same event over the next year, or newer events that's happening, like the Veterans Day Parade or the Columbus Day Parade, the Labor Day Parade, that happens on Fifth Avenue. And. Uh, I think, let me just skip the weekly thing. So even here, we could actually find uh, this, this is NYC summer streets where in three weeks, over three weeks, on three Saturdays in August, they open out all the streets to pedestrians and they have a lot of shops that's happening over there. And what I looked at so far is a minima when there's a disruption. But uh, one of the cases that, uh, what do you say, the Taxi and Limousine Commission are interested in is like finding these hotspots of taxis where there are a lot of taxis so that they can put in sensors now the taxis are upgraded with uh, newer uh, GPS devices which keeps collecting a lot of data at a much finer scale and they want to collect that data from them as they keep passing and they want to find places where they can place these receivers. So one of the things to do is look at these hotspots of taxis which are basically Maxima and see where the taxi hotspots are. And uh, again, in, in the graph, we just chose the top right quadrant over there. And we find that these are the top 10 uh, hotspots. And again, you can see that Port Authority and Penn Station are most common. And if you look at Queens, you will find even the JFK Airport or the LaGuardia Airport. And Columbus Circle, which is a popular tourist destination. It's right next to uh, Central Park. and. Uh, other places in lower Manhattan. An interesting thing is if we filter on time, say I want just hotspots that happen from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. What we find is you can find all the pubs, nightclubs, restaurants that's there in Manhattan. And I mean, there's one huge concentration here in East Village. Then of course, Hell's Kitchen has a lot of restaurants and so on, and you have. And this was again an interesting pattern which we didn't know why that happened and again when we asked those guys uh, what the TLC told us was it's like a lot of people especially in the night they go to pubs, clubs and then they take taxis and these are mainly the rich guys who take taxis and uh, all this is a very rich area in Manhattan and that's one of the reasons why they have a lot of uh, taxis in that area at that time and the night. So, so far, I focus more on these static patterns. And uh, again, I have examples which I can show later, uh, if time permits are offline, wherein the, ex the same thing that we did with the MTA data, wherein we could find uh, reasons or we could find stations where there are unusual uh, uh, delays in trains and so on. So some of them, the folks from MTA could immediately say why that happened, but they were surprised with a lot of other things and they said they'll, they'll be looking at that and uh, trying to see how they can fix it. So this part is, uh, this was presented in Eurovis a couple of months back. 
And here what we are interested in is more like mobility patterns and we focus again on the traffic in Manhattan. How can you find uh, how the traffic flows in a city? So you can have different kinds of questions to understand the mobility patterns of a city. And the obvious thing is scalar based questions. If you have all the speed or the traffic information, I want to see, okay, how does the speed vary at different parts or what is the density or how much traffic is flowing at different parts. Or you could also have more the actual flow based questions, which is like, how does the free flowing traffic or how, in what way or why is there a slow moving traffic and in what direction does the traffic generally go. And my focus is going to be more on the second part over here. So the first problem is acquiring traffic information. And uh, we still don't, I mean, you, there is no source that gives us detailed traffic information for the entire city. At most you can get this along the main avenues or the main streets. So uh, what we did, and I'm not going to be focusing on that right now, is, I mean, this is just a picture of some street in Manhattan. As you can see, you'll just see few other cars of other types, but the rest of it is going to be yellow. And this is a common sight in Manhattan. And uh, so it's like you can say the speed at which the tra uh, taxis are moving is the speed at which the vehicles move. They literally block the entire road. It's almost like the autos in Bangalore, actually worse. And uh, what we did is we have a model using which we take the taxi data and uh, we use the trips, we derive information about the trips and get the traffic information. And then even once you have the traffic information, how can you visualize these flow patterns of the data, how the traffic flows? And uh, that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So all existing work that work on looking at movement data or mobility data, they kind of focus on more like object movement. So they take an object, they have the end-to-end -end movement of that single object. They don't look at some sort of a collective motion. And or they have these density-based visualizations, they just connect the two points end-to-end -end and they don't actually look at the things. Uh, or of course, they just ask some questions or like, okay, where can I find uh, which roads are fast, which roads are slow, and so on. More static questions. Uh, in Manhattan, again, we check that too. So the data that you get is, okay, there are two problems. The first thing is you get only along the avenues, and not all avenues, only on some of the avenues and a few streets, like the 14th Street, or uh, I think there is one more, the 34th Street and so on. You don't get the in-between data for Google. Maybe they have it, but we don't get it out. Bangalore, I was surprised because uh, it seems to be live update. I'm driving here, it says density is dense. It is not dense. Yes, I think this is start. So I'm wondering why you're going through the GPS of a taxi instead of the general data from the telecom companies who are happy to give. No, they're not happy to give. So I'm pretty sure. So how is Google getting it? So Google gets it from your mobile phones. They have the actual thing. Everyone's using GPS nowadays. They know, and I'm assuming that's how they do it. I think um, they use cell phone the tower data and triangulate the position of the moving vehicles along the road. I'm, I'm really not familiar. They tap into uh, telco, and I don't know how Google is doing. I thought you may know. No, even I'm not sure how Google is. We tried but getting it. Fairly centered. It is based on cell phone, cell phone tower data. Okay, so we tried, so I think there are other projects with AT&T that uh, our group is doing, and even they don't give out data. The only way you can work with that data is if you send someone to intern over there and get it. You don't get that data from them. So there's another thing. There's also this easy pass system in the US. So they have easy pass receivers at different places, but it's again, it doesn't cover the entire city. So one thing is we don't, we didn't get any data that covers the entire city. And the second thing is we don't get historical data from that. At most you can get Apple Maps or Google Maps or any of those, you get live data right now and uh, you don't get it for the, 
historical thing. So that's one of the reasons why we did this convoluted process of getting and deriving it. And uh, there's actually a lot of work in the civil engineering part where they do a much more complicated models, but we were more interested and since it was Manhattan, we were like, this is good enough and we validated with the easy pass data. And we found it to be good. So again, the question is, is there a way we can visualize the flow of traffic? And uh, the inspiration, as I said earlier, was we, we want to try using vector field-based methods. Uh, but the problem is you don't have a continuous field like the traditional vector field domain. So what we have here is instead the road network, which is a graph. So what we do is uh, we create a vector evaluate function on the graph. So again, this is just a toy example over here. So if you take any intersection, you know the directions in which the traffic can move. And uh, we know the speed along that. Let's for now assume that we have the speed. And since we derive it from the taxis, we also have some sort of a density of taxis that run on that road during that uh, time period again. So the time step, you can divide it. And we divide it into time steps of five minutes each. So if we use that, what we get is we get some sort of a vector valued function, time varying vector valued function over the entire Manhattan over here, over the road network of Manhattan. But it is again, uh, and in order to visualize or uh, get information from this, we want to try using uh, flow lines from vector fields. So uh, for those of you who don't know, so basically what a vector field does is if you have a domain over here for each point, you, you have uh, the direction and uh, the speed or the velocity. Sir. And uh, given that a streamline is for a fixed time instant, you just drop a particle and the streamline tracks the locus of this particular particle. And uh, for a time varying field, you have again two types of uh, flow lines. One is the path line, which again you drop a particle and you know and follow where the particle actually goes. That gives you the path line. Or a straight line is you continuously keep injecting particles and look at all the particles, the locus of the particles. But the problem is in a nice vector field, you know that for each point the direction is unique. Uh, but that's not the case in case of uh, once you have it as a graph. I mean, typically over here, consider this x, the node x over here, or the intersection x over here. You can have, and if a particular uh, particle is coming from D, you can go in three other directions. So how do you decide what direction to go to when you try to look at these flow lines to visualize it? And uh, so what we decided, and this is just some sort of a baby steps that we are taking over here to try to understand the flow in some sort of a graph. And what we did was, let's choose the direction based on the application, what people are interested in. So for example, we, are, we want to see how the bottlenecks are at different places. So maybe we can choose something like the lowest speed. We choose a direction of lowest speed and compute the flow lines. Or if you want to see how free-flowing taxi uh, traffic moves, we can look at the highest speed. And at least in our data, since we also have the taxi density, if you want to look at how taxis generally flow, uh, you can look at the probable taxi movement. So I'll just, uh, okay, I'm almost running one thing. Uh, give a couple of simple examples as to how uh, informative the visualizations can be. So let's first look at free flowing traffic. And therefore we choose direction of high speed and we just uniformly uh, sample points at road intersections and we compute short path lines. We just compute path lines for a one minute period. And uh, this is what you get. And so here uh, the lines are color coded. Red lines indicate northward movement and uh, blue lines indicate uh, southward movement. And by just looking at this picture, you can see that there are a lot more red lines compared to blue lines. And so this is at, uh, we started the path line at 8 a.m. So it's for one minute from 8 a.m. And uh, this is a common thing. So basically, this is Central Park in Manhattan. This is near just above Midtown. And all the 
offices, the financial district, everything is much below over here. So basically, you have uh, faster moving traffic going upwards rather than downwards, and this for obvious reasons again. But that is not the only information that you can get from the single image. Again, if you just consider all the red lines on the west side compared to the east side, you see that the lines on the west side are longer compared to the east side. So even though free flowing traffic is faster in the northward direction, the speeds on the upper west side is much faster than upper east side. Uh, I still don't have a reason as to why this is happening, but possibly again a lot of people stay in this region maybe or I don't know. And another interesting observation again is you see that almost all the lines are vertical going either up or down nothing across the streets everything is across the avenues over here and which basically says a lot of slow moving traffic or the traffic is really slow across streets and one of the reasons is because of the way the signals are synchronized in Manhattan so this was I mean, we didn't know this when we showed it to DOT, they are the ones who told us the reason. So apparently, on the streets, the red signal, the stop is for a longer time compared to along the avenue so that they can regulate the flow much better. And due to which, generally, the streets are always much slower. But aren't the signals also, they have to also time, uh, time so that you, you get green when you are at the next signal. If you get green once, you get green. Uh, I don't know how synchronized it is, especially in New York. I mean. I've seen it gridlocked half the time. So. so this is what we saw at 8 a.m. And if you look at another time period, say something like 1 p.m., uh, you see that, again, there are more red lines compared to blue lines, but the speeds are much smaller in uh, both directions. But the interesting part is once you go to 5 p.m., you can immediately see that the number of blue lines increases a lot more. The red lines are much more lesser. This again signifies that at around 5 p.m., and this is the only time we notice it, the free flowing traffic, or the speeds are faster in the downward direction, moving towards Midtown and Lower Manhattan compared to those going upwards. And this is again people returning from work, but this is only at 5 p.m. So instead, say we are interested in looking at the f how taxis flow. And uh, here, since we are looking basically as to how the flow of taxis are, we take much larger path lines and uh, we take the density of taxis. And we look at it from uh, Midtown Manhattan. So these are the seat points in black, if you can see it. And you see that, again, at, in the morning, most of the taxis kind of, the general flowing, the pattern is more down, no, not much. It doesn't go up much. At Again, noon, 1 p.m., it extends a little towards the upper park. Maybe a lot of tourists come and they want to keep moving around. And around the evenings, you see that it goes uh, even higher. But again, the interesting part we found both here and even in the static patterns is when you go near Harlem and the upper part and near Bronx, there's almost no taxis over there. There's uh, severe lack of taxis. And even whatever taxis that go there, it's just for drop-offs and you just cannot get any pickup in that direction. This is actually a very interesting example and uh, where we really didn't have any idea until the folks at DOT could tell us what was happening. So what we did was we wanted to find out bottlenecks and we said, okay, let's choose direction of slow speed. And uh, we again just put a random set of points over here and since we want bottlenecks in a single time instant, we look at the streamlines. And we said, okay, let's put streamlines, let's see how the streamlines go. And what you can actually notice is, after some point, all these kind of uh, converge into these small orbits. So it's like, this is the slowest kind of moving traffic overall, what happened? PowerPoint crashed.
so what we again saw is uh, so this we could kind of figure out this particular orbit was like corresponds to Holland Tunnel. So this is the tunnel where a lot of traffic goes out and comes in from uh, New Jersey, Jersey City. And uh, this one we had no idea and this was some, and this one we found at different time steps. This one we found only at 8 a.m. And this was when those guys said that there's a school over there and this is like the drop off time for the kids. They go there and they parallel park cars to top of their kids which really slows down the traffic in that particular area. And at 4 p.m. again we saw a particular thing over here and apparently this is where, this is where there is free parking in Manhattan. And no wonder it's really crowded, especially at that time. Uh, it seems you just cannot go in that direction. And this is at midnight, and you can see that, uh, I mean, this is not very slow, but it's relatively slower near restaurants. So there are a nice set of restaurants in this part, and over here, and so on. Yeah, that's possible. So the thing is, uh, the way we did it was, we again don't know the actual route the taxi takes. All we know is the distance traveled. We know the pickup and drop-off location. So, uh, for any taxi, it's pickup and a drop-off? And a drop-off and the distance it travels, we don't know the route. If you already, if you know, already know that is a thing, no, it's no, no. pretty quick. I want to extract that. So all I want to see is, I know an event happens in Central Park. Mm. Let me look at the data. Corresponding week, last week, there's no event. Right. So, okay. So assuming a lot of people take taxis there, then you can find that as a maximum in the taxi density. And if you find that maximum happens only at that time, it would come as a rare event towards the side. So, so yes, you can extract such thing, but you wouldn't know beforehand that this corresponds to that. No, I don't want to, my whole point is, is there an interface with which yes. data, I can extract all this information and then do something about it? Yes, uh, I have the interface. Maybe offline I can try demoing the whole thing so to you. So I mean, that's... Are you making this interface available to these people and saying try it out? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Sure. Uh, let me skip this. So we can also simulate roadblocks. So basically to conclude, uh, the main focus at least on these two works was the application of visualization techniques in an urban context. And given the large amount of urban data, it's more like how can you help users understand the data, find interesting patterns from the data. And what we did was more some sort of a semi-automatic approach. We have the human in the loop. We don't hide anything. The uh, users can always look at other things in there. And uh, these techniques also is really efficient. It can handle large data, it can handle incoming data, and so on. And like I mentioned, again, I can show examples later for if anyone's interested. So we have some very nice results from Subway, which even those guys were surprised it happened. So we look at the Subway, and we look at the delay that happens over there, and so on. So we did some study with the MTA guys. But the general takeaway, I mean, you can do a lot to improve. So we found these orbits more by chance, by just playing around with the data. So it's like you can adapt vector field uh, topology techniques, try to find these patterns automatically, see what happens. A lot can be done. But the general takeaway here is that at least what I've seen, a lot of people, when they look at many of these cyber techniques, they apply it to just that particular kind of domain. The thing is, even in these other domains where people they somehow don't want to apply service techniques. I don't know why. It's they all go for a simple uh, infoverse kind of visualization, scatter plots, and so on. And these techniques can actually provide insight in, insightful views uh, to the domains. But uh, let me actually conclude with some. Uh, again, I focus just on taxi data and two particular examples with taxi data. But you have uh, urban data as such. There's a lot of data sets that's coming in. And there are a lot of challenges. So there is the number of data sets that are available is just increasing over time. 
and we are getting data not just in 2D but also in 3D. So there are places, for example, architects are looking at actual buildings in 3D. And then you're getting noise levels or uh, power consumption more on the height. So it's not just on the city, but it's also at different heights in the city. How is the different properties? So you're getting data in 3D. And this automatically uh, has a lot of open challenges in visualization, graphics, geometry processing. And uh, this is, again, just uh, something that is going to be uh, presented in this in another couple of months. So here we work together with architects and develop this 3D framework to visualize the data and uh, explore the city and the different properties of the city and do a lot of these analysis, the 3D analysis that they are interested in, looking at the sky exposure, looking at the impact of new construction and so on. And this is being used by architects. So this is a firm called uh, Con Pedersen and Fox KPF. And uh, it's a global firm and you are working with them and we have just started building this framework and we have other projects using this framework that's going on. And it's not just in visualization and graphics. I mean, there is data, obviously there are challenges in databases. So one of the things is you want these visualization tools, but you want queries over this entire data and in many cases it's like spatial, temporal, and you also have trajectories now. And you want to query all this data in real time if you want it to be useful. So interactive querying is something that I found lacking in any of the existing commercial databases. How much ever we tune it, how much ever we tried using it, using all the spatial indexes, but when you look at, put in multiple spatial attributes or multiple temporal attributes or put in trajectories, you can get it maybe in a minute, but that's not good enough for visualizations where you want subsequent responses. But it's not just here. There's also a lot of uh, challenges in data integration, data fusion. You have lots of data coming from different sources, and many of them could be common, many of them could be different. So how can you integrate and fuse all these kinds of data? How can you make sense of all these data? And given so much data that's coming out and open, uh, it opens a lot of questions on the privacy of this data. And of course, the analytics part of it, and you can use just, it's not just understanding single data sets. You can look at multiple data sets from multiple sources, trying to understand, put them together, find out different insights which you cannot gain from single data sets. And this again opens up a lot of challenges in different parts of CS, topology, statistics, machine learning. But what I would say is in any of this, visualization is going to play a vital role. Given the amount of data, any, you need some sort of a way to visualize and explore the data, and you can actually improve, be more efficient in trying to understand the data. So with that, thanks to NYC and DOT and, of course, the funding agencies. I can take questions. Yeah, that could be possible, yes. So that is accessible, the camera? Taxi camera data. Uh, I don't think that all images are accessible. I think he means traffic cameras. Traffic cameras. At least on the road. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, again, from New York, from what I could find out, the raw images is not accessible. You get some sort of derived data from that. I haven't looked at that yet. So I don't know what information it actually gives. But, yeah. But given that data, surely, of course. I mean, the more data we have, it, you can infer more, you can understand it more, but it also raises questions of, I mean, it could also become uh, difficult to doing this analysis. I mean, there's a lot of noise. You need to know how to sync it, their joins, and so on. Again, the time series, uh, what I know, so one of the authors of uh, the previous paper, the static thing, he's, he works basically on machine learning and statistics. 
So what he basically said was the time series, it basically combines it. It doesn't take spatial context into account. Or the way they do it is they divide the space into smaller regions. And they look within these regions. If you have something that is happening across regions, across multiple regions on the border, between regions, it doesn't capture those. Uh, well, it is again, one hour we thought was good enough and we found good results for that for the initial thing. For the later part, that's for in the traffic flow part, we tried it with different uh, examples. So for example, we had, uh, we did, one minute was a little too small because the number of trips that happened was very low and we couldn't get good coverage of Manhattan. So we chose something like, uh, I think five minutes intervals or so to do the whole thing. But uh, again, it depends on the application, what kind of events you want to find. If you want some disruption that happens in say just 10 minutes, you cannot find it if you use a one hour time step. But if you want disruptions that happen for more than an hour or two hours, one hour is a good enough time step. Not exactly that. One thing that we were thinking of doing was something like we again have these start and end locations, right? And you know, so you can think of each of them as just lines or single vectors. And you have a bunch of vectors and trying to maybe cluster them together in some way and try to see other kinds of patterns. So that is something we haven't done it, but it would really be interesting. You can find other patterns from the general way the trips happen and so on. And here we are, we're not, we are not again interested in the end-to-end -end motion. We want to look at more the localized motion in this case. So that's one of the reasons why we chose the flow-based approach instead. Talking about the bottlenecks, so let's say there happened one bottleneck at the middle of the city. Hmm. So it is going to affect and there will be few more bottlenecks because of that bottleneck between the middle of the city. So when you try to analyze the association, maybe there, is, there are two bottlenecks and they are associated and there is some time gap between. Uh, yeah, that's, yes. That's actually a very good question. No, we haven't done that. That's not something we haven't looked at yet. I mean, this is a uh, very beginning of the work. We just first got the information and we just did some sort of a, this is something new, the way you adapt vector field into this. So that was more like we wanted to see if this is going to be helpful and then build from here. So those kind of more like causality, like what you're talking about. The causality part is definitely interesting, which we have not looked at yet. Thank you.